All right. It is here. Movement Monday. Movement Monday. Welcome to the Ujima Hour. I am your host, Michael Tekken Strode. And we have a lot to celebrate this uh, this week um, or this month. Uh, there's a lot to celebrate on the segment today. Um, there's a lot uh, that has been happening of late um, that has been, you know, um, has, has brought me great joy. Um, and I, I'm, I'm delighted to, you know, share a few of those things with you all today. Um, of course, up today, you know, we'll, we'll be having, having a, a guest, um, Alita Ture, uh, Parable of the Sower Intentional Community Cooperative, um, which leads on the, on the heels of a, of a discussion that I happen to uh, be hosting um, with um, or on behalf of Foundation um, for Intentional Community and uh, Grassroots Economic Organizing. Uh, where I had an opportunity to talk to, you know, some folks from the Freedom Georgia Initiative, talk to uh, some folks in the Skokie Nation, um, and, you know, um, and, and several of the folks, you know, in sort of BIPOC spaces, Black, Indigenous, People of Color spaces that are doing um, intentional community work. Uh, of course, you know, it, the, the one thing that I, I want to highlight from that discussion um, is that our experiences are all of our sort of backgrounds and experiences inform what we bring to that conversation, and it's really important that we acknowledge that, um, and 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 not you know try to set that aside or try to name it as something else. Um, that that was the one sort of key takeaway that I got from that discussion. Particularly, you know, there was a a, a bit of tension around the, this this concept of ownership um, that we were grappling with in that discussion. Um, and, and I appreciated that tension. That was actually a very good tension, right? You know, that was a tension that was, that was a conflict that was not necessarily about, um, you know, sort of personal difference, but that there was a sort of principle and a political difference there. Um, but it was an important difference that was informed by the background that we bring to this conversation. Why do we come to intentional community and what are we trying to gain from intentional community? That's a really important element um, but I, I'm all the way into the conversation and I haven't even introduced myself, you know, fully. <laughs> um, yes. So Michael Tekenstrode, founding coordinator of the Cold Nut Collaborative, uh, a member and sometime facilitator with Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. The Cold Nut Collaborative is, of course, Chicago's only um, time-based service and skills exchange, otherwise known as a time bank, uh, where we trade, t trade our time as if it were a currency, because ultimately, you know, it is a type of currency. Um, so we, we put our skills onto the time bank, um, we, we trade our skills on the time bank, we log our hours on the time bank, all so that we can build an intentional community of practice around those skills. Um, so that, that's, that's uh, what the Colinet Collaborative uh, is and does. And the other side of that is the um, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. Um, which is also another type of intentional community. We are an intentional community of, of work around this goal of building worker cooperatives in black communities. And ultimately, you know, um, what we bring to that space, what we bring to that practice is um, a culturally informed approach to cultivating, to, to developing cooperatives, right? Um, we are interested in the history, again, that informs why people want to develop cooperatives and so we, we are interested in, um, in ensuring that that history shows up in the room when we are talking about cooperative development. It's not just about, you know, business plans. It's not just about, you know, governance. It's not just about legal entities, but it is about the cultural organizing that informs why we came to cooperative development, um, which is ultimately, you know, what, what we boil it down to, you know, is self-determination, right? Um, self-determination and of course black liberation is, is no small part of uh, you know why we are doing cooperatives um, so cold in a collaborative cooperation for liberation study and working group among other things um, you know of course um, presently board member with the US solidarity economy network um, which has afforded me you know a few um, opportunities to really engage in some um, some intersections internationally, you know, recently I, I had an opportunity to present to uh, FICOP, um, which is a, a Brazilian forum, you know, on the solidarity economy, um, connecting the, the sort of U.S. threads of the solidarity economy with the, with the work that's happening in Brazil, um, which is an imp a really important um, intersection. Um, I was not thoroughly prepared, you know, for that, that presentation. 
um, I was mostly a stand-in and hopefully a helpful stand-in to at least continue the thread and, and make the connection. Um, but ultimately, I was, you know, standing in for someone else, you know, who was intending to present there um, and did not have, you know, a fully prepared deck um, as, as our, my Brazilian comrades did, you know, which is, is really important because there is some real, real important work happening in Brazil. And um, there is there is a lot to draw upon. There's a lot of peer learning to happen between the, the two spaces of the U.S. and Brazil. And so, you know, I appreciated that conversation at Vicom. Um, so, you know, that that's that's what I've been up to. And, and, you know, that's ultimately why I am here in this space of the Ujima Hour, because, you know, I, I, I am, again, very, very interested in um, carving out space for the cultural history of uh, cooperative development within black communities. Um, why do people come to the work that they do uh, within the sort of black, the, the sphere, the realm of the black social and solidarity economy? What drives them to the, the, um, the analysis that they have, that this is a solution, that this is a way, that this is the future um, economic uh, you know, potential and, and practice that we should be engaged in? Um, and that's what we do here at the Ushama Hour. We dive into that history. We dive into those lives. Um, and and we, we cover what's not covered, you know? I mean, ultimately, this is about, um, about exploring intimate, informal conversation, right? This is about getting into the lives of, of folks who are organizing around the solidarity economy in Black communities. This is about um, archiving those conversations um, for posterity, you know? Ultimately, um, you know, all of us will be, uh, you know, not remembered in, in the sort of, you know, longer span of time. But while we are here, we can carry on that oral tradition. We can carry on that history. We can carry on those stories and we can do it by taking a moment to pause, taking time to document um, and taking time to draw out that history, draw out those stories um, while they are still happening, right? While history is still being made, right now we can document what are the challenges, what are the processes, what are the practices, what are the principles, what are the what are the ways that this is happening? Um, and we, we don't we don't have to wait until the sort of, you know, the, 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 the history is behind us and then, you know, a historian comes back and has to kind of scrap together all of the letters and the papers and the pieces. We can have certain conversations now. We can archive and document certain conversations now. And that's what we are doing on the Ujama Hour um, every month. Um, documenting those conversations, talking to people who are doing this work um, and, and, and learning from that practice. Uh, so that, that's why I'm here. That is, that is what I'm doing. And um, before we proceed, I just want to kind of, you know, update you on a few things that, you know, have been happening. Uh, so first, um, very great conversation within the Cooperation, Collaboration, Study and Working Group um, this past uh, Sunday. Um, so we were talking about Chapter 4 of Freedom Farms, um, which uh, deals with the history of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. And because when you're doing that deep cultural work and you're doing that, that deep cultural analysis, you don't just get to the layer of what the Federation is doing. There's what the Federation is doing and there's what that history and those stories connect to. So when we talked about the Federation, we got into a conversation, a sort of a conversational thread about um, Allende's government in Chile. And, you know, there was a text that someone shared, you know, that really talks about the political economy of Chile um, and, and what we can learn about that, what we can learn from the ideas of Am Amokar Cabral um, and how that connects to the sort of um, both the centralized and decentralized work that the Federation has done historically and continues to do to this day. Um, we even dug into, you know, um, some of those annual reports from the Federation, which are on the digital collage that we use for the group because, you know, ultimately, again, history is not just, you know, what has happened. History is continuing to be made in this day. Um, so, you know, um, if you have not jumped into a Co-op for Live uh, meeting, um, we are on break, um, you know, for the, for the sort of uh, remainder of December, but we'll be back in January, January 10th. Um, we'll be, we'll have another session um, again, it's a bi-weekly Sunday session that ultimately is about um, cultivating a group of people here in Chicago who are interested in cooperatives and who are interested in building relationships towards the goal of de developing a worker-owned cooperative. That can not only be, you know, a space of um, a, a space of, of, of financial, you know, return, but ultimately 
is a sp is a learning space, is a practice space, um, practice spaces which we need in order to um, continue to cultivate institutional uh, ground um, in, in the way that uh, the Federation certainly has done um, over their lifespan. So um, that that's certainly something you know to to uh, check into. Um, the other piece that I wanted to highlight is um, the. The National Public Housing Museum recently has started developing um, their cooperative entrepreneurship hub uh, here in Chicago, um, which is, is a very exciting thing, right? There's not only sort of, you know, there's this gr there's a, a groundswell, there's, there's, you know, things that are sort of at, at the layers and, and, the, and the, you know, at the ground level um, that are happening. So National Public Housing Museum, um, which also digs into the cultural history of public housing, right? You know, what are the sort of, or what's the oral history and the oral tradition of public housing residents? Um, where, where, where do residents go when they leave public housing? You know, certainly in Chicago, um, there is very little in the way of public housing left, and, and that's, that's a national picture. Um, so, you know, what happens um, and, and why is it necessary? Why is it important to kind of document that history? Uh, because ultimately, you know, um, we we reap the benefit of that history in fighting for policies that assure that the next time we achieve something like, you know, real public housing, real social housing, you know, you know so we're, we're, you know, may, beyond sort of public housing, it's about social housing. When we get to that goal, we don't want to, you know, have folks um, that don't that 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 lie to us about the history um, and tell us what you know public housing could not do, um, but we, want, we actually want to have the story of the folks who were there on the front lines and who, who, who know why they um, needed public housing, why it was beneficial to them, and what were the hindrances that were involved because people divested from public housing, um, which is the real story. So um, National Public Housing developing their cooperative entrepreneurship hub because they're moving to a new space, um, you know, launching their, their gift shop. Um, but you know, I, I had an opportunity to present on behalf of Co-op for Lib, um, the, what's effectively, you know, uh, a little, a component, a piece of, you know, the, the cooperative gallery that we, we worked on as part of, um, our conclusion of reading Collective Courage. And so, um, you know, had an opportunity to share a, a part of that history, a part of that gallery, um, because ultimately the gallery is meant to be an immersive experience that gets people as sort of a gateway into the, the, the phase of cooperative, uh, development that you know might be more technical in nature. This is the cultural component. The cultural component, the technical component, and you know the sort of embodied experience of, of developing cooperatives. So um, that that was um, the you know we, we did the presentation with the uh, National Public Housing Museum. Um, they will be uh, developing a cooperative, a working group for their cooperative entrepreneurship hub. So uh, be sure to you know check in to National Public Housing Museum uh, and their website if you. Are, are interested in, in um, getting with that working group. Um, yeah, and, and you know, um, there was uh, one, one more component around the sort of digital collage, but you know, um, I'll, I'll digress on that point. Um, and yeah, and I, I, I've already highlighted, um, I sort of buried the lead or, you know, or just kind of advanced the lead, you know, ahead. Um, that piece around ownership that happened in the grassroots economic organizing and foundation for intentional community um, discussion. It was a two hour piece around um, intentional communities being developed by um, BIPOC folk. And again, that key around what experiences we bring to our development of intentional communities and what ownership means. You know, there was, there was a real tension around what ownership means, what we are trying to get to when we talk about ownership. Um, and, and what, what happens when we sort of get lost in translation between, um, what ownership may mean over here and what ownership may mean over here. And specifically, you know, we, it, it was, it was a real tension around, you know, um, indigenous notions that, that, you know, land, land and water, you know, natural resources cannot be owned. There is no ownership there. Um, and that was at, at, at tension with the, 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 the historical experience of black people in the Americas that we that had very much had no notions of ownership, even to the even as a claim to our own bodies. Um, so all of that is um, part of the practice of cultivating intentional community, and all of that as we are developing intentional community um, apart and or together um, are things that we need to ta to grapple, to tackle, to dig into, and 
and I hope we I hope we get there. I'm I'm hopeful. I am I am hopeful that we will get there. Um, and certainly, you know, I am looking forward to seeing what our guest uh, today has to say about that. Um, so our guest for today is uh, Alita Ture, um, organizer, um, queer homeschooling mother, liberation strategist, um, documentarian of Black liberation movements, um, and and uh, worker owner um, at Parable of the Sower Intentional Community Cooperative. Um, her organizing fingerprints are over things like the Free Marissa Now campaign, the New Jim Crow movement. Um, and, you know, we are looking forward to really seeing, you know, what um, what brings her to this analysis around uh, cooperatives as a solution and also, um, you know, how that connects to the direct action organizing and, and um, some of the other uh, assembly work that uh, she's done in the past. So um, with that, I am going to uh, go ahead and bring in uh, Alita into the segment. Um, so thank you very much, Alita. You are um, you are here. For, for our viewers. Welcome. Thank you for having me. If I can say in Kosisikilele, Africa, Malupaka Niso Panduayo, Iswe Nutando, Zoyete, in Kosisikilele. It's just our, my way of introducing myself with our native tongue, just like the natives introduce themselves with their tongue. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, so I, I like to open these segments, you know, with uh, very much an open ended question that really helps people to guide us. Um, um, you know, where you are now is, is, is sort of kind of the, the moment in the present, but what's the runway that gets you from where you came from up to this present moment? And you dig into your origin story as much or as little as you need to. Sure. Um, I guess where I am now, um, we're all here in Corona in these boxes, right? <laughs> and, uh, I think um, in thinking of that, I think of myself um, when you say where I am, I'm glad to be a part of a we. And I think that is the difference. I know thousands of people I'm finding out through Zoom calls by themselves, um, living by themselves, uh, caretaking for themselves, maybe receiving mutual aid. But um, where I am is understanding the need for something that is bigger than me. Um, and I would like to say for myself, my daughter came up with um, a, this title, Parable of the Sower, because of the, the book that I had her to read as a homeschooler um, called Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. And so when I say we, I couldn't have done it by myself. But also the process of coming into cooperative, intentional community, knowing this and wanting to do it was because of something called University of Vendetta, University Without Walls. And we did that through something called a People's Movement Assembly, which brought all these people that was in my nonprofit, New Jim Crow movement, that freed Marissa Alexander. We came together democratically. And with the resolution after the People's Movement Assembly, we came up with things we wanted to do. So where I am is always hopefully, prayfully, with the knowing to do it in cooperation of others, um, including, you know, just the factor that this was something I was blessed to. My great grand great great grandfather built 10 houses for his 10 children on the land in Burlington, North Carolina, and it was a homestead. It's still there. Um, but the knowingness of that is also, you mentioned Cabrell in uh, Cape Verde, my family, right? Um, my aunts, who are six floors, living together in the same building where all their children went up and down the streets, up and down the stairs, crawling like we did. And now they're grown lawyers, but living cooperatively in a building like that. So I would like to think that I am doing everything that I am because of the we. I would like to think of that first when we talk about this conversation of economics and cooperativeness. Absolutely. Um, so in your in your background, um, I see this uh, work with MIT around um, urban planning. Um, one of the things mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I have found both as I've talked to urban planning professionals, as I've talked to folks who've gone through like, you know, Cornell for architecture, everybody seems to come out of the technical professions with a critique of the technical profession. Um, how mm -hmm. does sort of urban planning background really inform the, your choice around the work that you're doing now? Sure, that's a good question. And I love this part because it talks about the idea of what people think is most important and the value. I think coming out of MIT, because I was an organizer, 
I worked in CDCs, Community Development Corporations. I was known um, to do a lot of work in HUD, um, HUD properties. I was in charge of over 5,000 properties in one place, 5,000 in another, and new, doing HUD housing as well as community development was why MIT said, and I'm gonna say Mel King, because of his diversity, he started um, the uh, for he started the Rainbow Coalition for Jesse Jackson. Mel King has a program that says, no, these people in the field are more important than these people that are teaching and learning at MIT. Let me bring them and let me give you an office, which he gave us. He also gave me a, a assistantship for the professors. And these students that came from around the world in urban studies, because their parents were um, MIT and Harvard students, they learned from us because we really were doing the work. And uh, we, I was with Ernie Stevens from the Oneida Nation, Ernie Stevens Sr. Um, his mom started the dictionary for the Oneidas. I was with some people from Hawaii, Zeta from Turkey, some uh, you know people that were in organizing. And why were we at MIT? because the society says that MIT's professionals are more important than us. And we had to show that, no, we do this work. We're more important because we do it and practice it in cooperation, but showing the communities how we can come together through this thing that I'm calling feminist economy in the teaching from ourselves and our cooperative, but also some of the principles that we're gonna talk about today, I hope, um, in the book, Collective Courage, and why even the work I was doing as a filmmaker when I did uh, you know, Eyes on the Prize with um, Henry Hampton, doing six films with him, he built a film company uh, where I was picked at Emerson College as a film person to work there. And we won that Emmy because we worked in cooperation. So again, that val validity of MIT is that people like Mel King says, no, you're not as valid. And what's invalid is those people that are really doing it door knocking, knowing how to use and come together with elders and youth in a democratic processes are the people you need to allow to teach. And so we were able to do that. And he did that program for over 30 years after he started Tent City. Um, and then also in that MIT and Harvard, you know, cause we were also at classes in Harvard. I got to meet Paulo Freire, who was a mentor also who also validated why I taught political education. So yes, it comes from a long length of um, knowing that what is knowledge isn't always the knowledge from those that, um, that present it, which is why this information about collectivity and intentional community is important. When we say patriarchal and colonialist and capitalist, neoliberalist, um, imperialist system, they have four different groups that I think of, and that is the over um, exploitation of nature, right? The consumers, the violent social uh, relations and the state and democracy. And when we talk about what we're building, feminist economy, like we are for the pure build so it's a sustainable mo life model. We say that the empowerment of nature is first. The political subject is one of the four. The new social relations is one of the four and the social political organization is um, one of the four. And in the center is sustainability of nature instead of capital and profits. And so what does that say for economy? It says that feminist economy has basically come up with these um, structures, which are false dichotomies to us, public versus private, production versus reproduction and reason versus emo emotion. As feminist economies, matriarchal um, societies that came out of Africa, which was that the family and the home were more important. And that's the work you don't hear about when we say some woman that receive, um, I don't know if you can hear me still, I think it stopped. No, absolutely, I can hear you. <laughs> Oh, okay. When we say the social, global, and sexual division of labor, I'm talking primarily that work and wages within this framework doesn't conclude home, right? And if I was to say to you, I was doing all that work with Troy Davis, right? Who was, um, when we started that, he, you know, I started that because his mom asked me to help. She knew of the work I did with Mamiya, right? And this work I did with the films. And I was a teacher then. But the most important work was that with my children, we built this movement and mothers also came together because their work hasn't been validated. 
And if we were to account for all the work, as Paulo Frez, the people and the students will emancipate for freedom, when we calculate all these hours that we do as parents, right, in a feminist home, right, which comes from the knowingness of nurturing, we are validated. All the works I put in for Troy Davis or Free Marissa now is never as substantiated as what I've done for my children. And that's why we're saying we're going back to a feminist economy, where not the value of production is most important, but the, the production of sustainable, um, the sustainable uh, pieces of, of um, not imperialism or neoliberalism, but the sustainability of life, basically what I was saying early, sustainability of life, which refers back to the home. And so when we build a cooperative parable of the sower or even any other intentional community, we're not just coming from a word that's westernized to just gain money, right? In the book um, by Collective Courage, um, we talked about work uh, reference of state uh, stability and making policy and shared profits and the triple bottom line, right? And that's the econ economic business, the social uh, mutuality and participation and ecological sustainability. All those are important, but just imagine this. We switch it a little bit, take it out of the capitalism um, framework, the neoliberalist framework, right? Which says that it's just about money, but it's also about livelihood. When well, we're time banking, when I worked with Edgar Kahn, right? He started time banking in legal aid. When we worked with him, he said time banking meant what you're doing, Alita. You're allowing parents and children and youth to come into the office. They give time for the work they did with the new Jim Crow movement. And in return, we give something else. And that's almost like bartering in Africa. But it's also what Palenques in Cuba were about. When slavery ended, they ran to Palenques and Bat Caves. It's about what Columbus, when I was in Brazil, in Bahia, I was teaching with Oludun. It's about what Columbus, when they come together, they're in the rural areas and they're in the cities, in the IA. They're talking about when we were resistant, not just with Capoeira, we came to give in time. And with time is why we can live in this thing called collectives and intentional communities and cooperatives now, right? But the resistant model for black people was we had to live. We had to live together. We had to create something called the village that we were taken from in Africa. So I bring the intentional, um, what do you call it? The international global perspective in this whole thing called cooperatives. It's important to me because it's not about just us having um, just the money and the patronage that we're going to grant. It's about really doing this for our ancestral DNA, which is we need to live cooperatively. And so um, with knowing that, there's the Palenques, the Colombos, the Maroon Villages. I visited the ones in, Q in Caribbean, um, I'll, um, uh, in Jamaica. There's um, right on top of everything um, where they have on their land, the children taught me how they knew every herb, right? So the only time that that could have happened when we take, think about intentional communities in the US is or native lands in the US is that someone like an elder taught those children how to, to identify things in the, the lands of, um, of, of Puerto Rico um, or uh, Jamaica, Palenques, or, um, so what we're saying is we're gonna go back to the teaching that every work is important and it's called a feminist economy. Um, and that comes from the GGJ, which I'm a part of, the Parable of the Sower is a part of the GGJ, which is building the feminist economy, which is to go back away from this patriarchal thinking that we need um, the capitalists and profit in the, in the middle. We want companies to, you know, like if we were to say right now, we want to have Amazon union workers, right? Instead of those people working for Amazon, we want them to own it. That's a worker owned cooperative. But the reason isn't just so they can be in charge of a business and be a un you know, in a union to, to make a document to say that they've won and they're in charge. It's to go back to the needs that right now there are women who are pregnant, right? Who can't get um, time off. It's to go back to a feminist economy, to go back to those things that are seen as necessary, where we live again, like we did similar to Africa for most of us, 
because we lived in a village where everyone was validated. The mental health issues were not as big because we were together, right? We're defunding to have instead now social workers to come and support because some of that money should go to us being more human. A feminist economy goes back to that perspective of a village. Why? Because we say we center the human in the middle. We center the community where the mental el illness is um, supported because everyone's together. The elder is supported. It wouldn't be like right now, all these elders by themselves. They don't have intentional communities. They don't have families. The LGBT are ostracized from their family. They don't have community. And a lot of the women and children that are ostracized in schools or even in their own family be because they need support won't be ostracized again. Intentional Communities does all of this. And the framework I believe is more because we uh, will be reviving like a black cooperative movement. The reason why we had the black cooperative movement according to Jessica Gordon Nippard was because after we use mutual aids to survive and take care of each other. And then when we became lucrative, what happened? Folks didn't like that. And when I say folks didn't like that, you know, a lot of the unions that were started from the black cooperative movement were white people that said, we want you back. Don't leave us, you know, come work for us. We'll make sure to give you what's right. We'll give you a, a and instead we, um, we decided for those cooperatives to build in our own community. The dollars circulated seven times when we started housing development. When I worked for HUD Properties and the Community Development Corporations, we talk about circulating seven times and that's when we did set, um, time banking. I had young people in our organization, we made some money and we allowed to see what would happen if that dollar circulated in communities. And we found out we could do it for ourselves. But somebody wants a piece of the pie. That's why it's colonialist and capitalist and, and state and democracy. And in the center is capital and profit. We're trying to go back again to a feminist economy and uh, hopefully parable of the sower will show others, that is our intentions on how that can really play out um, by just first being politically, well, just having political education in the center. Um, and when I say political education in, in the center, University of Sinfonteras works for us um, through the Southern Movement Assembly. Um, that's why organizing is important. We have a plan of action in times of crisis right now for the first 100 days. It's about new social economy, people's democracy, protect and defend our communities. All this um, with Project South and all the organizations that we work together cooperatively. We don't do this whole thing called poverty, pimping, or um, Olympics, oppression Olympics, we say, let's all do this together. That's how we defeat the enemy. And the enemy is anyone that sees us as the smaller part of this uh, economy, rather than um, the individual, we come together as a collective. Absolutely, that was, uh, that was <laughs> so, um, but we appreciate so, uh, it. But we appreciate it. Oh. Oh. Give me that cool. Let me see. No. Um, um, so the next step I want to go to. So the next step I want to go to the, around the. We were talking in the. Around the. the around. Around. How. Into how. Into a community. How, into a community. And, and, sorry, this echo is really. Sorry, this echo is If I can address this. If issue. I can. Okay. Testing. Testing. All right. I will fix All right. it. I will fix it. Testing. Testing. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. So how do people so, enter into intentional community? What's the process for facilitating orientation and really bringing people into intentional community? Yeah, for ours, it's a little different. Um, we, because we are movement-based, we already have the people that we've worked with. Um, when we freed Marissa Alexander, there was 37,000 organizations, um, including people. And so those members of working together, do, having a toolkit and going back to their state 
and saying, oh, we're going to do this action with them because we're going to free Marissa. We did days and years and raised $100,000 in one year. So those people are already in uh, what we say formation, right? Because we knew each other. We worked together. We struggled together. And so we're not saying that others can't be a part of that. What we're saying now is that to do intentional communities, you have to do a lot of political education. Um, Mandragon um, in Spain, um, there is a group called Irismendi Pizza and they helped to us to get our paperwork together. And what we found out with Irismendi um, was that they were able to assist us in ways where businesses um, or SBA or you know uh, communities that were primarily about the systems business would not have given us just their paperwork or their the the right way to go about it. And um, we found out that to join intentional communities, it's about who's willing to be politically educated. When we do University of Vendettas, I had a five-year-old child. I had a lawyer who was retired at 84 and everyone talked in a circle, democratic round robin. And if we can't do that, then that person isn't ready to be in a democratic process. Um, so we, we're we hoping to teach first what the black uh, tradition, radical tradition taught us is that to be in formation, we have to learn. We gotta go back to some of the ways where the elders and the young people came together, like I mentioned in the beginning, the village. It wasn't just the young people going out and doing the work. Like we see, you know, right now, uprising 20, 2020, it was about the youth on maybe conference calls with these elders to talk about when they did this, because remember, the Republic of New Africa and other organizations had intentional communities, but when do we learn from them? When do we interview them? Have we talked to Mamiya? and Matulo Shakur about, and Asada Shakur about when they did it. That was the whole plot for this government. Not for you to ask the people that knew really how to do this because they've been there. And so that is our whole thing first is to educate the people, young and old, disabled and trans. Um, and, and then from there, if we have a, a what we call a curve of discipline um, we start to be soft towards each other. We start to say, well, I don't want to talk to those gang boys with their pants going down their butts. I don't want to talk to those mothers that were in prison because I was an educator in a college. Um, you know, we start to see that we need each other and it's not um, you're better than me kind of mentality. Um, and that's the first thing for us is intentional community means time banking. Everyone that wants to be involved Let's get together like the village that we left in Africa. That's the only way we'll, we'll need each other again. Black Flight did something to us. And Black Flight did the thing, which is it had us to rely on individualism and not the need of our elders and our young and the disabled and to really bank on this system that says mental health means put them away, um, put them in prison. And as prison abolitionists, we want people to understand why that's important for us as an intentional community that we pray um, will support the Black Lives Matter, support the Black radical tradition, um, support Cabrell's work and all those ancestors and, and free Mamiya and free those political prisoners that really put in some work. And also be a place for domestic workers and sex workers and women right now um, for Black women that are the bare bones of communities. Um, so that's what we're hoping is that we first deal with, as Mandragon and as Mendy taught us, deal with political education every day. So um, the next, next step I wanna take is just that um, we're on some common listservs together and I've been, you know, watching on a few of these listservs, just the sort of conflict that's kicked up. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm very interested in this question nowadays um, of, of how we engage, how we manage, how we deal with conflict inside of movement spaces and, and where we go with that. 
Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in what your thoughts are in terms of, you know, um, engaging conflict, whether it's in sort of the small space of an intentional community or in this larger space of movement work. Mm, good question. Um, I, I'm a Libra, so I go with usually all references, all ways. I, I, I have to say um, that is my prize, and, and though I've been blessed, I'm thankful that I know that it's not just going to be on the intentional community. There's going to be a lot of people that can't get into our intentional community. When I look at Oakland and San Francisco, right, there's a lot of people in the cities, and we're going to be, you know, maybe outside of the cities, but um, we still have to go back to the people just that couldn't be a part. Um, and, and what I mean by that, like um, a lot of the organizing in this type of thinking, the South is well known for land, right? And so a lot of people in the cities rent, not own. And so what does that look like where we can do freedom riders, people come down from the city into the intentional communities in the summer? You know, and then sometimes the uh, legacy of the work and technology within the uh, cities, we have people from the intentional communities go to, you know, to set up in cities where they're building their own gardens and community gardens. So I, I think it's both. Um, I think it's democratic a process that we have to have intentional communities so people can understand all this lingual, ling linguistics that I'm talking about because it's better to be in, immersed in it, to see how it survives. When we talk about the movie Wakanda, right? Black Panther, to see it, we envisioned it. When we saw Matrix and then saw Zion, right? Remember Zion? We had to see it in a movie to understand possibly that. When I say Fahrenheit 451, and that village at the end where, you know, the elders would recite a book that they learned and pass it down, we had to see it visually. And I guess that's, as a filmmaker, I understand that, that people have to come. And so a lot of the work right now um, in teaching this in the communities of color where housing is the first issue, where um, health is the biggest as well because a lot of people can't afford and don't have um, health care, and also this, the mental health issues. And that's why we have healing uh, responders. All those mechanisms Go, are a part of the intentional community, but by showing up in these communities like I am with People Strike, which is something I really believe in, with all these many groups, um, we are trying to say we can build these things, but we have to build them and people will come. We have to show people their remembrance because there's amnesia <laughs> and they want us to have amnesia of how we had Timbuktu and villages in Africa. They want us to not remember that there is um, not just Rose, what do you call it, the Black Wall Street and other um, intentional communities I call or you know, or towns where there was wealth. We always had that. In the book called Collective Courage, she names thousands. And um, that's our piece right now is to show that it's not gonna just be in intentional communities, but intentional communities allow us to turn off the music, turn off the distractions, and be with community 24-7. The Native Americans that I connect with, like Ernie Stevens, and all those, including my family, you know, with the Cherokee within our bloods from North Carolina, it's important to say, when I go back to those ways, that there is no time. If they have a meeting, they don't do like us in a nonprofit um, office. They don't say, well, we're only not working nine to five. We got to cut this meeting short. In the native tradition, in our indigenous tradition, as indigenous in Africa, we do it until it's settled. I pride myself to see when I was with the Bahia, in Bahia, with the um, Quilambos, right? Because they come together often, all of them, that they went until it's done. They didn't have a time frame. And so I believe that to teach these things in a democratic process brings us back out of the amnesia and um, hopefully with the feminist economy, economy as a, a, a measure, we will see changes that are necessary that goes back to wisdom, um, Sankofa ways, so. All right, and so then, and so then share with us um, about the share Black with Cooperative us. Movement. Uh, what's, what's going on with that document? 
Yeah, so yeah, the Black Cooperative Movement came about first because I was documenting first because we weren't getting any support for our cooperative <laughs> because people are like, stay in your lane. You know, people say things like that. Like, you are good at organizing, stay that. And I said, you know what? Women will always be organizers. We learn it, you know, I learned it from my grandmother. Um, and, and, you know, those are just things that black women do. Look at, you know, all the women that have helped and steered stuff like Asada Shakur and um, Winnie Mandela and Queen Mother Moore. But when we started to see that people weren't taking us serious because we were black women, we said, okay, well, let's show you. And as because we were into political education, we started to document all these and talk about, right, all these many cooperatives that stood, right, through Collective for Courage. She documented all of them. And so people couldn't say to us anymore, and I'm talking about black, not only white organizations, but black organizations that said, wait a minute, you all aren't savvy into this. You know, this is something new. And we've got to see that, no, this isn't nothing new. You know, in the 1700s, it started in this country <laughs> and and you know and so when we find out that we can bring this information to to show people that we're viable to have it we are self-determined you know um we we started to see that chronicalizing it we were talking about it but people couldn't see it you know as a filmmaker people have to see um and so we put together all of the different cooperatives and intentional communities on our site it's called um www.facebook.com and it's um, revived BLK co-op movement. We, we put all the cooperatives that was in her book and then we put pictures of them to say, uh, look, it's right here. Wait a minute. What do you mean we're not, this shouldn't happen? You know, um, the Kahambi Valley River Collective, which was black woman, you know, and the whole thing was we realized people didn't want it to happen because there is a fear of us being prosperous. It's, there's a fear that HUD women, right? Because I also work with HUD women and all of our movements would be self-sufficient where they wouldn't need the state. They wouldn't need the federal government. They would be living like they did in Africa. You know, when we look at um, Shaka Zulu, Shaka Zulu was expelled from his village because of patriarch, right? She was a woman that had a child out of wedlock. But look what her son became because of her steering, Shaka Zulu became the one that emancipated and, and um you know, threw um, colonialism out the window. He fought, you know, and so we're saying, no, give us, not to, not to say we're not gonna be in society, but we, give us that way where we can depend on each other, raise our children together, come up with a feminist economy where everything that we do in the home is validated. And the time banking like Edgar Kahn, who started Legal Aid, says is invaluable, is important. The same reason we don't want prisons, it's valuable. So in our movie, in documenting this on a website, on a Facebook page, someone said, Alita, you're a filmmaker, why won't you make the movie for this? And I said, well, let me see, because you know, there's group members in a cooperative, you gotta go by the group. But what we find out is that our products and services are through community organizing, like the Black Life Alert and the Black um, Trauma Anonymous, like the NA or AA, we have Black Trauma Anonymous, why won't we also have a film so that people won't forget after they watch this talking that I have here, <laughs> that we'll see all the beautiful songs and dances and music and, and, and then the visuals of these places where governors and sheriffs burned cooperatives and intentional communities because of the fear that was happening then. And we're saying now in this com in this day and age, after 2020, you all should know now, because of the fear of the uprising pandemic, that we have been the ones that have died and passed and haven't been able to trust that we can live in harmony, right? Because of the Declaration of Human Rights, we should be able to strive and be self-determined. And so that film, yes, is something we hope to be one of our first products and service on the land for our intentional community where everyone that will be on our land with us would be working on this product and we come out with not just you know shea butter or things from the garden we sell at the farmer's market but also go back to what my uh, ancestor now henry hampton provided for me 
he showed us that as film students and um, all the other people that wrote all the books for Eyes on the Prize, they were always in our office. We can come together cooperatively. And we, um, I feel strongly that this is the way of the future. This is the parable of the sower book that I think um, Octavia Butler talks about. It's now, right? Who, who would have thought? My daughter did, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that the time would be right now. And I think we are all our ancestors' wildest dreams. But to do that, we need each other. And then from there, we trust and there will be no fear. So, um, so um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna mute this for a moment. Just make, confirm that you can still hear me. Okay, excellent. No, um, I'm just trying to manage that echo. So I'm doing my tech thing in the middle of the, the interview. But um, one of the things that um, I had an opportunity to, to um, attend recently as a delegate of the US Solidarity Economy Network, I was at SMA, SMA9. Um, so, you know, it was my first SMA, you know, experience. That was a beautiful experience. Um, so I, I'm interested in your feedback on Southern Movement Assembly and the People's Movement Assembly, sort of um, one at, you know, what is that experience? What is the assembly for? And then, you know, just kind of draw the relationship between that and the cooperative work that you're doing. Because one of the things that I've been sharing lately is just how important facilitation and governance is to being able to enter into cooperative space. So um, just share, share with us sort of your relationship with the assembly facilitation and how that relates to cooperatives. Sure thing. Um, yeah, I talked a lot about the People's Movement Assembly and how we came together as a cooperative. That's how we were built. Um, so the tradition of Southern freedom movement and the black radical traditions, um, you know, the vision of liberation of land with Chokwe Lamumba under where I worked with him for Campus Vico and bodies, autonomous bodies and econo econ economies and political power is all what we do um, when we talk about principles of unity um, for the Southern Movement Assembly. When we come from all those different states in the South, remember they were came together because of the World Social Forum, which was the US Social Forum, we come together because we were rooted in history, right? We knew the history of movement, you know, Ella Baker, um, Fannie Lou Hamer, Martin Luther King. And that's why the cities such as New York or even Oakland um, have to be rooted in knowing that history because that's where it was at. That's where these legacies came about to put down um, in paper and to show democratic processes, right? And, and so we use the multiple strategies, first of all, because we're all in different states, but we convene. Some of those conference calls for this SMA, I've been on for eight years, every week. And so that talks about that discipline that I talked about for political education, is in nonprofits, we get distracted. We believe we need to go out and have some good time and eat some good food in a place that's not even rooted in tradition of black and brown people. And, and so we, we spend more time in that rather than making something so disciplined, so so much about trust. Um, and, and then that's where we have the practice of community governance. Um, we have a wonderful Southern movement blueprint um, that aids people to live in, you know, in detentions or finding practice in governance or to live on community, whatever. We, you know, we just decided to put all those together in this blueprint because not one person is going to do it the way Black Lives Matter is going to do it. Not one person is going to do it like the U.S. socialist, uh, the African socialist is going to do it. Not one person is going to do it as um, the um, the the what is it called blacks just black workers for justice, the union in, in North Carolina. Not one person is going to do it like some of the other uh, Republic of New Africa, because there's 54 countries in Africa. And so we may all do it differently, but how do we find the prize, which is how do we work together? And that's what the Southern Movement it does. The Southern Movement Assembly takes local leadership, right? Because base building, we take um, respect of organization self-determination, right? We validate everyone. We just listen to each other, first of all. And then we principle dialogue. And dialogue principled is why there's so much bickering amongst all these organizations because money has come in in the middle of all these groups. 
where um, it doesn't assure the collective accessibility or defend our ground and, and resist and build the political framework. Instead, we want to say, well, I'm more important and this group is more important. And, and, and you know, this group is doing the real work. Instead, we listen to each other. We validate how many people in the room thinks one thing. And then from that practice, which is so international global, when we look at other countries, they all say together, all right, we'll fight. I was on a conference call, I believe this weekend, um, when talking about Southern Movement Assembly, um, where a Native American um, woman mentioned how they didn't agree with some of the elders back on for Geronimo, for, um, you know, the fight on Geronimo and why Geronimo, um, I can't remember exactly the fight that was happening. But the young people said, well, we listened to the elders and we just agreed with them, even if we didn't get everything we wanted in. And the reason why that processes doesn't happen anymore a lot of times is because we don't put the time in. We don't include elders and the young and other organizations. But if we did that and taught a practice where we just listen to each other and, and not fight, um, but, you know, find a way where we agree to disagree. Um, it's almost like, again, going back to Wakanda, Black Panther, if there is a real fight like in Africa, what happened to the other villages? They fought with Black Panther. When it came down to it, they had pragmatic debates, not fighting. They just knew that a pragmatic debate means that we can agree to disagree, but we don't get blowed up because of our trauma, which is why we do have the Black Trauma Anonymous, so that we never talk to each other again. And so in this society, it's all about money, who has the most power, who has got the most funding during the uprising, you know, so we'll listen to them. No, it's not about who has the most money is most powerful. It's that everyone should be at the table, just like in a village, the young, the old, the rich in our society. And Southern People's Initiative does that. We as a Southern Movement Assembly say together in all these different states, uh, Texas, North Carolina, uh, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, Arkansas, we say that we believe in a new social economy. We believe in the people's democracy. We believe in protect and defend our communities. But we came up with that because of the process. And again, it goes back to that political education until we sit down in our seats and not to be so technically uh, uh, 21st century where we can't do something more than three hours, but take for us nine to 10 hours, right? And then we listen to each other and, you know, put some celebration and music and dance also. And, and we get to hear each other. And, and I think that's the thing. We don't take that time. We don't include everyone in that. In nonprofits, it's only the director and all the ones that they looked at the resumes to find that was more um, acute and, and, um, and that was top of their classes in college. In, in the democratic process, it's no such thing as it's about who's in academia only. We want the mothers we want the the uh the garbage truck um workers we want the nurses we want the the youth we want hip-hop and all of them have a right to be in the circle and then with those inputs we come up with a plan not we come up with a plan because i'm a nonprofit and i got more money than everyone else and i think that's the principles that we're hoping to bring back is that everyone's included and not that we disseminate this this uh, project or plans of executing uh, movements after, but they're centered to be able to do this work. And um, if you want information on that, there's a, a really good booklet we have it's called the Southern People's Movement Assembly Organizing Toolkit. Feel free to get that. But more importantly, also the, the People's Movement Assembly um, Toolkit, which is basically a handbook that shows people how to put together a people's movement assembly. And that's what we're gonna be using in our intentional community. We want to steer that work um, with our allies, white allies, you know, black, brown, and an indigenous BIPOC. And I'm so glad you mentioned um, the Bi BIPOC group because right now, <laughs> all the BIPOC groups I'm in, um, including, you know, all across the country, it, we're trying to implement this whole thing of democratic processes, um, which is going to keep us and maybe build us to a place like Mandragon, like, you know, um, hopefully a society. If it's trickled down from one and 
you know, we'll be able with the support of places like Federation of Intentional Communities, um, we will have an economy, um, including like GGJ, feminist economy, we will see it trickle down where it is the norm. It is a social, um, it is the social norm to live in community and cooperation. So there are a few areas that I, I want to touch upon. Uh, one, I'll just name there's in the comments here, there's a question about diversity of tactics. Um, do you believe there's a governance structure that is most effective for building power collectively? Do we need a common alternative system to capitalism and white supremacy to overcome both? So I'm just going to bookmark that and just, you know, uh, allow you your space for that in a moment. But um, I, I also have a question about, you know, the role of imagination in, in the work that you're doing um, and our, our capacity to use imagination to um, overcome some of these barriers that we are, are tackling. So I'll toss both of those to you. <laughs> I'll, I'll start with um, uh, what you call imagination for 500, <laughs> as they would say in that TV show. Um, <laughs> imagination, I am a filmmaker, but I'm also a dancer. And, and I want to say I'm a dancer, but I'm a househead dancer. And um, house music, and my partner is a, a jazz musician. So when we talk about bebop and, 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 and you know, just freestyling, right, as a househead, right, Creativity, I think the reason why I've been really good in organizing is because I believe in the hip hop movement. I believe in the youth that come up with something off the grid and that there isn't just a one traditional way. I believe that we need to change and evolve, which is some of the things in the book, Pure Above the Sower. We always have to change. And the elders in Africa knew something, and it's our Sankofa knowing that they had to be flexible. They had to pass over the baton to know that the next generation to be creative would be these youth today that use these dances in my flash dances like my daughter did in front of a courthouse with 300 of us for the Southern Movement Assembly. My daughter came up with a, hit, a mob flash dance. And so there they were in the front and in the back were the elders, you know, over 80. But they did it with us. And I think creativity says in this thing of building an economy. How can we, like I said, for the feminist um, framework, how can we go from over exploitation of nature to empowerment of nature? How can we go from the consumers to political subjects? We are the subjects, not consumers, right? How can we go from violent social relations to new social relations? How can we go from state and democracy to social political organization? And, and I think the, and that's the innovation, that's the creativity. You know, um, it, it will mean that we will have to think outside of the boxes that were built through capitalism, right? Um, feminist um, archeology span and food sovereignty um, really deals with the equilibrium and land and territory sustainability. And I know you talked about the indigenous and this land back movement movement that they're in, you know, and, and, and how important that the nature it, it's not owned by anyone. Right. And, and that's a lot of our indigenous and African people also, but it's about the people's lives are prioritized over the interests of corporations. It's about the public policies and laws generate the re recovery of life. Those are creative things that we can show through Paulo Freddy popular forum theater. Right? It's about the popular power that is strengthening in decision making and expansion of democracy. Um, and so to know that it may be stop talking sometimes and let's sing it. If I said, let's create a new world and I bring in what my grandmother gave me, which is what, you know, in the vernacular of the church, it will be I want to hear more gospel and, mm -hmm, and the feeling because we're so much into their language. The Western culture. I'm speaking words, right, that were fed from a, um, a culture that doesn't talk about freeing our and, and giving us autonomous bodies and sexualities and relationship with the respect of diversity. So I'm going to have to sometimes not talk. And I, I do. I come into spaces and I want to just sing or move. And then when people start to move, they say, wow, we're human. And then we go back to that thing of being human, like the declaration of, um, of human, 
you know, the declaration um, through the United Nations and, and this whole thing of generation of networks of care and affection and diverse and expansive of families. It's not about an agenda for a nonprofit, you know, or legislation. You know, if we can go into these spaces that are, uh, when we say University of Sinfandetta is without, University Without Walls, we mean go into these uh, courthouses, going into these buildings um, bu built from Western culture and, and, and make it fun. S you know, do a little poetry in there. And, and, and I think that's the creativity. Make them to be accountable that we want, again, solidarity and economy and cooperatives through cultivation of plants and food and medicine um, in maybe tribal wear, you know? And, um, and then the commodification of earth and extractivism um, versus, you know, this whole thing of, of exceptionalism, all of that would be included in there. Why capitalism and social racism um, is disposition and patriarchy is reproductive labor instead. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's about creativity, creativity, about being not as long-winded as I am and use my <laughs> my artistic side as well in the in balance, right? Um, so yeah, uh, I think that's why we have to have youth in, included in this. They they break this stuff down and it don't sound so heady, and I love that. Yes, yes, um, I love that as well. And you know, fortunately, I I am part of um, am part of a. I'll call them a narrative building group, you know, um, we right now we have uh, something called Another Meme is Possible, and it's a group of, you know, folks who are probably who are, who are younger than I am, but, you know, effectively have been talking about um, doing the sort of creative cultural organizing using tools like TikTok, um, which, you know, are, are certainly, you know, amongst the, the tools that the youth use nowadays. Um, so we're, we're, we're about to put a cap on things, and I just want to, you know, um, see what's missing from this interview what do people need to know about parable of the sower what are the, the the components that you want to leave on leave with people as we uh begin to kind of wind down hmm i think the biggest is um knowing that whoever it is in your family um as a people as whoever's listening um center what felt good for me it was in my grandmother's arms um, in church when she was singing and stomping her feet. And, and knowing that those little things are a test right now during COVID. How do we recreate, that, create, recreate those feelings of good times? For me, I love to cook because my other great grandma cooked every Sunday for the church, for her children, for the homeless people. And so I recreate that. So how do we bring those into our spaces? Not just in a work, but in home life. So that, like uh, Edgar Kahn talked about, it's time banking. So for those of you that want those feelings again, why don't we retract from fighting the system of they're not giving us what we need um, in, you know, for rent or mortgage, and, and let's build it together. Let's build it where we are accountable to each other. And so there's fear. And that's the reason why we have it. That's why my brothers and sisters from Asia who come here, they can live together, work in the um, Chinese restaurant and buy 10 houses after. My family's in Mexico. They come here from their countries, live together, still together, and then they have wealth because they don't care where they work. My families from a lot of um, international global communities have been able to live together, but because of my psycho psychosis of PTSD, post-traumatic slave disorder, Dr. Joy, um, I wanted to reach out to, we, we think that our trauma won't allow us to live in community. And it will, if we trust. And we can find a way to bring down the fear by just trusting that one good feeling you had from something of your ancestral because your ancestors are waiting. They will help us. And the next generation, which is my biggest thing, um, if I can say this to you right now, is that the seventh generation has called a, a, a piece on my life. Um, it's not about me or my children only. It's about, I know that that seventh generational child um, will say that I, I tried to live out of fear in this place where they're only gonna hear about. So. 
trust. Find that spiritual groundedness and find that fear is only going to leave you isolated. We need each other and we can build that. And uh, I hope we do this together. And we hope we see you too, um, Mike, um, on the land with us, especially for Land Corp. So I'm going to give you a personal invitation. <laughs> I look forward to that journey. Look forward to, you know, seeing the, seeing the land. Look forward to building in community. Look forward to, you know, moving through these challenges and these conflicts and these tensions. Um, I look forward to, uh, you know, there was a quote that we closed in Co-op for Lib, um, the, uh, yes, on Sunday. Um, from Zora Neale Hurston that said, there are years that ask questions and there are years that answer them. And, you know, um, and, and, you know, we were kind of joking around like, you know, in 2020, that a year that has asked so many questions of us, I hope that 2021 is a year that answers a few of them. Um, so, you know, I appreciate you. Tell the folks where they can dig in and, and catch up with Parable of the Sower. Tell the folks how they can keep up with the work. Yes, www.parableofsowercoop.com dot com um, or on our two Facebook pages um, and that's Parable of the Sower um, co-op and then Revive BLK co-op movement and we have a Kwanzaa coming up for seven days so join us in that first understanding of political education and celebration a little house music a little saxophone from my partner a little youth involvement and political education Ujima, Kujichakalia, Ujima, Nia, uh, Imani, all of that is a part of intentional communities. So join us for that. And uh, yes, thank you for having us on this. Thank you. Absolutely. We definitely appreciate, you know, you joining for the interview today. Um, we will, you know, uh, go ahead and share out those Kwanzaa gatherings. You know, certainly we will talk about them because we will have some special Kwanzaa episodes that folks will be digging into. Uh, so, yes, you know, definitely appreciate all of, all that you've shared today. Um, apologies for the sort of technical, you know, glitches that were happening there. But, you know, hopefully we kind of navigated through them as best we could. Um, and, and I appreciate your time. Thank you for having us, Ashe. And so it is. <laughs> and so it is. And so it is. And I bid you good evening. And I bid you good evening. Thank you. Asante Sana. Ashe. Ashe. All right, folks. Um, yes. Uh, thank you all for tuning in this evening. Yeah, there were some technical glitches we were working through there. You know, fortunately, you know, my IT spidey senses kicked in and, you know, I did what I could to kind of negotiate with that. We'll clean all that up for the podcast feed and, you know, um, extract what we can, you know, um, that's useful and necessary from that, that uh, interview. So I hope that, you know, you all picked up some pieces from that discussion this evening. Um, Alita Ture, Parable of the Sower Intentional Community Cooperative. Um, make sure that you're, you're digging into the People's Movement Assembly and the, the work of the Southern Movement Assembly. Um, make sure that you're thinking about, you know, those governance strategies, those techniques and tactics, even as you enter the, the, the um, intentional community space and or the cooperative space of all sorts. Um, we need to understand how these governance mechanisms work. We need to understand the importance of facilitation inside of these spaces. Um, and we need to understand the importance of, of finding a strategy through conflict, finding a strategy through accountability, um, and we need to get comfortable in, in that tension very quickly. Um, we need to get comfortable in that tension very quickly. So, you know, as I close out this broadcast, I say to you, um, be comfortable in the tension. Just kind of, you know, hold your hands up, hold your hands out, whatever you gotta do and say, I am comfortable in the tension. Um, Yes. Uh, so again, you know, Co-op for Lib, we will be back um, in January, January 10th, uh, specifically um, 3 to 6 p.m. Um, on Zoom. Check the Facebook page, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. Um, of course, you know, keep an eye on the Cola Nut Collaborative Facebook page uh, because we are always posting, you know, um, anything that happens with Co-op for Lib there. And check us out in, in um, la the latter half of December. After December 26, we'll have a few special Kwanzaa episodes that we will be coming out. Um, Miliaku um, from Twice as Good um, in cooperation. Um, Lasaya Wade from Brave Space Alliance. Uh, Maida McNeil is coming back um, from Honeypot and Fifth City Project. 
Um, so be sure to you know uh, keep an eye on the on the the Facebook page of the Colonel Collaborative. Um, check out those uh, special edition episodes. And we are booking guests for 2021. Um, so we've got you know um, a good lineup from January to March, but we still got you know several months to to confirm. So if you have someone that you would like to see on the Ujima Hour, um, you know who I will make sure that I get a thorough sound check with at top, you know, so that we don't have the echo we had tonight. But if you have someone you want to see on the Ujama Hour, uh, please make a recommendation. You know, you can certainly comment on this video. Um, you can send it as a message to the Facebook page of the Cold Nut Collab. You can email me at connect at colonutcollab.org. That's uh, connect, uh, C-O-N-N-E-C-T at colonutcollab, K-O-L-A, uh, N-U-T-C-O-L-L-A-B.org. Um, so, you know, feel free to email me there if you want to make a recommendation or make an introduction um, or send a message. And, you know, um, I will make sure that I get them booked in for an interview. Um, and, and because ultimately, again, this is a long form interview, long form, in, um, intimate, informal conversation with folks who are building cooperatives that will take us into the next economy, um, that will take us into the solidarity economy uh, within black communities in the future. So I thank you all for tuning in this evening, uh, and I wish you well. Uh, tune in again um, next month um, when we will, um, not yeah, we'll tune in again in, at the end of December, but then <laughs> at the top of the year, um, we'll be back with uh, Erica Allen um, from Urban Growers Collective and uh, Gr Green Era, you know, so look forward to that conversation. I will see you all then. Have a good evening. <laughs>